Hello, this is David Harper of Bionic Turtle with a look at liquidity support in a securitization for FRM candidates. This is from Christopher Culp. Previously in a securitization, I looked at credit enhancements. And now it's important for us to draw a difference between credit risk and liquidity risk. Credit risk refers to defaults on the collateral, the credit sensitive assets, or credit deterioration in those credit sensitive assets. Liquidity risk, on the other hand, is about timing of the cash flows and a mismatch in timing between the cash inflows and the obligations owed to investors. And so liquidity support refers to the mechanism used to manage that liquidity risk. For example, if the collateral, again, that's the credit sensitive assets, are a pool of mortgage loans, then there can be either structural or delinquency based liquidity risk. The structural risk refers to the fact that these mortgage loans can be prepaid. Prepayments are the result of turnovers or refinancings. And that means the cash inflow that is principal repayment is somewhat unknown over time. That is a structural liquidity mismatch in the securitization. But there can also be delinquencies on the mortgage loan. So these are borrowers with late payments. If the delinquencies remain merely delinquencies and not defaults, then these late payments means that there's a delay in the cash inflows on principal and interest, and that can cause a liquidity mismatch. So we can see that delinquencies by themselves are liquidity risk because that cash will come in. It's just a matter of delay. However, if the delinquencies move over into defaults, then the liquidity risk becomes credit risk. So in the case of mortgage loans, we can now see there is both liquidity risk due to structure. That is to say, the prepayments which are expected but unknown in their timing, and secondly, due to delinquencies. As another example, consider the securitization of trade receivables. These are account receivables or ish invoices issued to customers. These are a common type of securitization. However, there's a built-in liquidity mismatch because the trade receivables are non-interest bearing. However, the notes, the asset-backed securities issued to investors are generally interest-bearing bonds. So between the non-interest-bearing inflows and the interest-bearing outflows, there is a structural liquidity mismatch. So the securitization manages the liquidity risk primarily with four approaches, and they fit under two broad categories. The first is internal liquidity support. And within internal liquidity support, the first way to manage liquidity risk is with the design of the liabilities, the structuring of the liabilities. And so, for example, in the case of time tranching, if we look at the tranches that the different investors hold, if the mortgage, if mortgage loans are the underlying collateral, then the senior note Labeled here, A1 is subordinated by other notes, A2, M1, the mezzanine layer, and X, the equity layer. It may be that the senior note holder, all principal, not the interest, but the principal on the collateral, is directed to repay the senior note holders first until their principal is completely repaid off, repaid. And then the principal goes to pay the next tranche below, the A2 in this case. So that means that the mezzanine tranches, for example, their principal repayment is unknown in regard to timing because they will be waiting for the senior notes and their principal to be repaid first. And this is a way to manage the uncertainty of the prepayments and to some extent the delinquencies. Another example of liability design is the use of the extendable notes. And so this is a type of security issued to the investor that has both a, an interim maturity and a longer final maturity. But the interim maturity 
is more like a call or a call option, and the securitization can choose to not meet that interim maturity if the if the securitization does not have the liquidity to do so. So this gives the special purpose entity flexibility in funding those investor notes. So the second type of internal liquidity support is the use of a liquidity reserve, which is much like the cash collateral account that we saw under credit enhancements. And this would typically be funded by cash from the waterfall. And so the cash flow waterfall puts money into the liquidity reserve and that reserve can be used to handle some of the liquidity mismatches. So now we've seen two, the two primary types of internal liquidity support. The first was design of the liabilities to handle some of the anticipated liquidity risk. And second, the use of the liquidity reserve. Next, in regard to external liquidity support, one, the first primary method for managing liquidity risk is the use of a line of credit with recourse. And so historically, these were more popular than they will be going forward, largely due to the difference between Basel I and Basel II. But historically, the originator would provide a line of credit with recourse. And the special purpose entity could draw on the line of credit to fund some of the liquidity risk. And under Basel I, short-term lines of credit did not incur a capital charge for the bank, but this was a kind of loophole, really, that's been closed in Basel II. The second primary method of external liquidity support is important, and that would be the use of an asset swap. An example of an asset swap, although I'm commingling some interest rate risk with liquidity risk here, but a good example would be that if, again, if that collateral was were a pool of mortgage loans with adjustable rates, then the cash inflows are going to be somewhat are are going to be variable along with the interest rate. However, if the special purpose entity issues fixed coupon notes to the bond, then there are floating coupon inflows and yet there are fixed rate outflows. And this could be handled with an asset swap. So the special purpose entity could enter into a swap with a counterparty where the special purpose entity pays a floating coupon, and that's because its, its own cash inflows are floating with the adjustable rate, so it can pay the floating coupon, and then in exchange for that, the swap, it receives a fixed coupon, and that's what it wants to receive because it has a fixed coupon obligations with its investors. So we've now seen two examples of the external liquidity support. First, line of credit. Second, the use of asset swaps. And now we've seen two types of internal liquidity support and two types of external liquidity support. So I hope this was helpful. This is David Harper, the Bionic Turtle. Thank you for your time.